Hello and welcome to an episode of Historically Mart. I am Jason at the Golden Spike National Historic Park. And this is um, technically part of Promontory, Utah. I'm Please forgive me, I have a hard time pronouncing that word. I've, I've said Promontory, blah, blah, blah. But anywho, this became part of the National Park System in 2019 after many years of getting this to be part of the system. And this is where the Transcontinental Railroad, the first one that went from coast to coast in the United States, was completed. I'll be taking you to that spot. There's, of course, a lot of historical markers here, and I'll show you around the place, visitor center. There is a fee to get in. Um, it was $20 at the time, so it may change, it may vary whenever you do come visit here. And yes, um, this is definitely off the beaten path, but there are signs if you do want to visit here, like say if you're coming from Interstate 15 in Northern Utah, there's highways and it's about 30 miles from Interstate 15 or the 15, whatever you say it. So join me as I take you to this very cool part of American history. Here we go. So here's the visitor center of Golden Spike. And upon entering, you get a marker about the Southern Pacific Monument, which is that right there. We'll get up close to it in a second. And it says here, in 1965, the National Park Service assumed ownership of the aging monument, which had been damaged by years of weathering and vandalism. The interior had also been severely damaged by groundwater that had wicked up into the monument through its buried base. Early restoration attempts unintentionally contributed to the damage by using materials that did not allow for evaporation of water trapped inside the monument. Based on state-of-the-art technology, the NPS began a new repair process in 2001. Now the monument was built in 1916 by the Southern Pacific Railroad, formerly the Central Pacific Railroad. It placed the monument near the site where the nation's first transcontinental railroad was completed. For decades it stood there, a lonely reminder of the driving of the last spike on May 10, 1869. Today, the handsomely restored monument remains an icon of westward expansion, the settlement of northern Utah, and commemorates an historic event that transformed America. And here is that monument, and yes, it has age, just as the marker says. And yeah, it's unreadable, but hey, it's pretty cool. Just gonna get a little touch it a little bit. <laughs> Close to the entrance is this map and marker here. It says here, a journey across the plains was a formidable undertaking that required great patience and endurance. Now all has changed. The six months journey is reduced to less than a week. The prairie schooner has passed away and is replaced by the railway coach with all its modern comforts. And that was from Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper, December 11th, 1869. And below it is a map and a guide to some of the other related sites. Now, I am of course right here at the visitor center Behind the visitor center, where you know, after you pay your fee, is the last spike site where you can stand on where the nation was connected by 1776 miles of rail. Coincidence? I'm talking about the number. <laughs> but you can also drive like continuing on that road. However, you may need a four wheel drive road to see some of the parts of the trail. But like you can drive to the part where the Central Pacific crews finished their 10 mile day here, having laid 10 miles and 56 feet of trek. And you can also visit the Chinese Arch and the Big Trestle site and the Big Fill. And here is the gift shop. Be sure to buy some souvenirs while you're here. Support the National Park System. And if you're a National Passport Stamp geek like me, just make sure you get stamped. And of course, make sure it's facing the right side. Okay, this one needs a little bit more ink. All right, and right in front of me are the locomotives. I will probably not be around when they do the demonstration. That's about a couple hours from now. While I'm here, I might as well enjoy this with this historical marker here. Last spike driven. On noon, Monday, May 10th, 1869. Wait a minute. That's, uh, the anniversary was yesterday. How about that? But, um, <laughs> a rough crowd had gathered at the far set of tracks 75 yards ahead. Six million spikes and six years' work lay behind them. Now only one section of rails was left undone. 
the honor of ceremoniously, ceremonially, sorry, finishing the Pacific Railroad was with a spike mall hot wire to the telegraph line fell to the rail barons who had spearheaded the road building, Stanford and Durant. Speeches were given and then a lengthy prayer. Governor Stanford stepped up, took the hammer, swung and missed. <laughs> swing and a miss. Then Dr. Durant took his turn and also missed the spike. With each swing of the malls, the crowd of working men broke into spontaneous applause. James Strobridge and Samuel Reed, the crew bosses for the two roads, then took up unwired malls and divided the last blows behind them as the air exploded with hurrahs. With, a, with those last few swings, the billion dollar dream of the world's first transcontinental railroad became a reality. Here are the pictures of Stanford and Durant. Gotta get out of the sun there. And here's a picture of that event. And then this is where it mentions about transforming communication. Not only did the Railroad Act of 1862 lay out a grand plan of connecting the continent by rail, but the legislation called for a communication transformation as well. A telegraph line was to be strung along the transcontinental route, ushering in an era of instant communication from coast to coast. For four years, Americans closely followed the progress of the Pacific Railroad in their newspapers, anxious to see it completed. By May of 1869, Intense and attention was focused on this desolate corner of northern Utah. The entire country was eager for the word that the last spike had been driven. <laughs> and this is where they installed electrical poles. And here's some more National Park Service markers. I'm just going to read off this one. The original rail spanning a continent. The Pacific Railroad Act of 1862 mandated that American-made iron be used to fabricate all rail for the Transcontinental Railroad. Although steel was more durable, it was not widely available in the United States at that time. It was a costly import item primarily reserved to make specialty products, such as swords, such as swords and precision instruments for the Civil War. In contrast to steel, iron was easily accessible in the United States and cost much less. And then here is the shape of rail. They call it a pear head. As we all know and learned about in elementary school, the Transcontinental Railroad brought a period of unpre unprecedented growth and prosperity to the United States. But the use of iron rail was outdated technology, even as it helped to usher in this new era. The outdated iron rail was soon replaced with sturdy steel rail, which became widely available in the U.S. by the 1870s. I'm about to go over there in a minute, but I thought I'd kind of take a little trek down. Here's a plaque to the Irish who toiled on the Transcontinental Railroad uniting our nation. This was dedicated in 1996 by the, the Hibernian Society of Utah in 1996. Here's some more commemoration plaques, like this one was certified as a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark in 18, I'm sorry, 1969, the 100th anniversary. Now here's a little map. Lacking precise instructions from Congress as to where to meet and spurred by financial rewards for building grade, both railroad companies prepared rail bid past each other for 250 miles. No parallel track was ever laid. And Promontory Summit was chosen as the point for the joining of the rails. So the locomotive right in front of me is the Jupiter. And here's a lot of history on that, but I'm just going to kind of filter it out. So in 1868, Schenectady Locomotive Works in New York built the Jupiter for the Central Pacific Railroad. Steaming her way into history, the Jupiter hauled Central Pacific President Leland Stanford's special train to Promontory Summit for the joining of the rails. The Jupiter remained in service until the turn of the 20th century when, outmoded and unheralded, she was scrapped for the standard fee of 1000 In 1979, it was restored and it was returned here. Well, it, it took about four years of work and to restore it to how it looked back in 1869, but, but it was O'Connor Engineering Laboratories of Costa Mesa, California, took on the sizable task of constructing working replicas of the original Jupiter and the number, nine, number 119, which I'm about to show you. 
And there's some details if you want to know more about the Jupiter. And then I'm going to go, go up close to it. And that smoke you see coming out of it, yes, you can definitely smell it. I'm sure it smelled the same in 1869. I mean, I wish we can kind of go up there, but I know they got it blocked off and everything. And this baby is a wood burner. So it smells pretty much like you're at a campfire, basically. And then all these American flags, and you probably can't see it because they're blowing so fast because of the wind, but they're definitely 1869 flags. And remember, Utah was not a state yet at the time. And then this here is the number 119. In November 1868, Rogers Locomotive and Machine Works of Patterson, New Jersey built the Union Pacific No. 19. Six months later, it received the call to pull Union Pacific Vice President Thomas Durant and his contingent to, to Promontory Summit. The No. 119 served out her days with the Union Pacific as a freight locomotive until dismailed in 1903 for the standard scrapper's fee of 1000 And here are some of the, hopefully you can see it, but the sunlight's kind of bothering it but this thing runs on coal and yes there are some coal there it doesn't say on here when it was restored but i'm assuming around around the same time as that one from 1979 and here's a timeline well there's a few other markers but i'm not going to go through them all this is just all the detailed events like i did not realize promontory or Promontory, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really having a hard, difficult time pronouncing that town, but this was, it was once a ghost town, and right after, of course, this railroad joined together, it was definitely a sin city of its own. A lot of gambling and going on. But there were some good people that lived here, probably. <laughs> and then I'm gonna go right here, and this is not just your typical rail. The last tie laid on the completion of the Pacific Railroad, May 1869. Talks about all the sponsors and directors and everything. So a very cool piece of American history. And like I said, they do have at least three demonstrations a day. Unfortunately, I'm gonna miss out on them. But this is where they all sit and where they do the show. All right, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Historically Marked. Hope you learned a lot. And whether or not you're into railroads, this is definitely a cool place to come check out if you're um, one to add one to your national parks visited sites list like I did. So definitely uh, come on out. I am Jason, signing off.